And if you were to look at all the things wrong with Angel Rach, it, it would just blow your mind. That I mean, this was I mean, she had everything you can imagine, in, in, including inoperable tumors. She had a mysterious wasting syndrome that caused her to lose at least a pound a day. So I mean, she would just waste away. She could, she couldn't walk. She had, I mean, I, I can't even list them all. I mean, we list them in the in the book, but it's unbelievable what this woman went through, and. She was told, you know, you know, you're going to jail. We can't, uh, you, you can't do that. So the thing finally went to the Supreme Court. Now it's worth noting that all the so-called liberals on the court, like Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Stephen Breyer, you know, liberals they believe in individual liberty, right? You know, and conservatives want to force the Bible on everybody. That's the caricature, you know. Well, in fact, no. Stephen Breyer was all in favor of uh, of criminalizing this. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, oh, what? Well, Always, federal government supremacy trumps all other values at all times for liberals on the court. It, it seems to, be, to, to me to be the case. The, the one person who actually took a really principled stand was actually Clarence Thomas, who said that the whole substantial effects test is totally bogus. It's got no history in the, in the, in the Constitution or anything like that. But what's interesting was that Angel Rach was arguing that her rights were being violated by the federal government. And now she's got to reckon with Caroline products, that the federal government is assumed to be right. So she's got to look at footnote four and see, well, how do I show that nevertheless, even though you're assumed to be right, you're, you're actually wrong? Like, how do I even argue that? And the Caroline products decision, footnote four, says that the only way you can prove your case against the federal government is if the right you are alleging has been violated is a, quote, fundamental right. Well, well, you know, fundamental, what's that? Well, the government's going to get to decide that. In later cases, it's, it was later explained to us what a fundamental right is. A fundamental right is one that satisfies two conditions. It must be deeply rooted in this nation's history and traditions. And secondly, it must be implicit in the concept of ordered liberty. So, okay, so they take a completely amorphous, impossible to understand requirement, and then they just add another one. <laughs> so Angel Rach went into court on, and, and basically made the argument that she is trying to preserve her life and avoid unnecessary pain and suffering. And she says, that seems to me to be deeply rooted in this country's history and traditions. And that seems to be, you know, have something to do with ordered liberty. But here's the problem. What if the court defines the right in question differently? What if the court says, no, we say that the right you're claiming is the right to use marijuana f for medical reasons. Now, does that sound like it's deeply rooted in American history and traditions? Does that sound like it is as deeply rooted in ordered liberty? So the problem is now the court can stack the deck against you simply by deciding how it wants to define the right that you're claiming has been violated. So in fact, she walks in there and the court you know, listens patiently and then the decision comes down that uh, yes, we understand. They actually say we, we believe the testimony of her physician, that this is the only treatment that will be satisfactory in this case, that everything else that's been tried has had side effects that are even worse. This is the only option she has. We recognize that. But the real right that she's claiming, they said, is the right to smoke marijuana for medical reasons. So we're going to restate her claim that way and then rule. Well, how do you think they ruled? Sorry, you can't do it. In fact, Here's how the case actually reads. Federal law does not recognize a fundamental right to use medical marijuana prescribed by a licensed, licensed physician to alleviate excruciating pain and human suffering. <laughs> Look, they said it, not me, all right? Unbelievable, right? Now, but I don't, nevertheless, when we wrote Who Killed the Constitution, our, our goal was not to say, Look at these crazy Supreme Court justices. What a bunch of jokers. It wasn't to do that, because there are so many books on that, you know. I mean, you could, you know, you could build a little fort out of them, you know. So we say, yes, you know, there are a lot of crummy Supreme Court justices, but, you know, it's not like these Supreme Court justices, you know, just drop from the sky onto the bench. Who put them there? The other two, two crummy branches, right? So we want to show that all three branches in collusion have pretty much overturned the Constitution. It's not just these, these crummy justices. And in this specific case, we see all three branches doing their dirty work. Because, okay, you got the, the crummy decision in 2005,
But then you have, you know, so that's the, the judicial branch. But the executive branch, of which the DEA, the Drug Enforcement folks, are actually just a, you know, a subsidiary part of the executive branch. They're the ones whose raids on these people started the whole thing in the first place. So there's the executive branch. But then the legislative branch bears a certain share of responsibility as well. Nine days after the Raich decision came out, Congress refused for the third year in a row to approve a measure that would have prohibited the Justice Department from expending any funds in the prosecution of cases like, like this one. So all three branches are, are responsible. And so we don't just have, you know, so we, we're looking at crummy presidents, crummy congressmen, they're all crummy is basically our, our, our message. Because if you look at the legislative branch, how many congressmen, okay, I know, you already know the answer is one. <laughs> but, but how many congressmen, you know, sit awake at night thinking, I just don't see any constitutional authorization for what it is I want to do. Like, it doesn't even <laughs> remote, I mean, they would laugh at that. It doesn't even remotely occur to them to think this way. If we want to bail out some crummy bank or some institution or whatever, and we've got a majority vote here in the Congress, then we're just going to do it. Like, it does not even occur to them that there's any limitation on their power. I mean, a common example of this is we all remember the Prohibition Amendment. In fact, I was in D.C. Some of you know the Prohibition Amendment is the 18th Amendment. You know, you can't, no selling alcohol or, or having fun. I think they struck out the <laughs> having fun part at the last minute. Get some of the states to ratify. But, but I was in this hotel in D.C., and they actually have a bar. It's called the 21st Amendment Cafe, which is the, which is the amendment, of course, that overturned Prohibition. So that, that, that's good fun. But you notice that they did that with a constitutional amendment. They realized, well, you know, we don't want people drinking, but you know, the federal government has no authorization to do that, so we better amend the Constitution. Whereas today, if they wanted to do that again, you think they would amend the Constitution? They'd just do it. Like, it wouldn't even occur to them. I mean, even in the war on drugs, for example, I mean, as many of you know, in, you know, 1937 was when you started to get, um, uh, you know, this, the war on marijuana specifically, but even that wasn't an outright prohibition. It was just imposing absurdly high taxes on these substances so that if you got caught with them, it wasn't possession per se, it was tax evasion. Because there's no way you paid taxes on this. We know that. We made it impossible. <laughs> and that's why we did it. But then around 1969 to 70, they, we get the, Con the Controlled Substances Act that just says, you know what, we're just going to ban all these things. Well, okay, well, what changed between, you know, prohibition and, and now that suddenly you can just do that by legislative fiat? Well, nothing other than they just don't want to bother anymore. But the executive branch, oh, I could linger lovingly on this one. Because there's, there's just so much to despise here. You know, and we've got so many people, and you know, I'm happy that people don't like the current president. I was happy that people didn't like the previous one, you know, and so on and on. And in fact, I'll, I'll never forget uh, one of my favorite Lou Rockwell lines. It was from maybe 10 years ago, and he said that, that his greatest hope was that Bill Clinton would be the last president of the United States. You know, like that would, that the whole institution would somehow go away. But, but my point, the point that we make in this book is that, gosh, to just focus on George W. Bush, I mean, there's a, an embarrassment of riches there, to be sure, but gosh, you're missing out on so much 20th century goodies, you know? I mean, there's so much to dig out here to just focus on him. And it turns out that so many people who are anti-George Bush well, they, they love presidents who uh, basically did largely the same thing. And these are presidents that we're all taught to admire and love in our, in our textbooks. Well, specifically, one of the instruments that the executive branch has used to circumvent the Constitution is the executive order, which is a directive issued by the president that requires no consent from Congress. Now, strictly speaking, that's not in and of itself unconstitutional. The president, for example, has the constitutional authority to pardon people. And he can pardon people by executive order. But there's always the temptation to do other things by executive order, like pass a law that he doesn't think he could get through Congress. Well, he's, of course, not authorized to pass a law. That's why he's in the executive branch. But what's to stop him from doing it? And in fact, we've seen this done over and over again. In the 90s, that crummy Paul Begala, who was an aide to uh, Bill Clinton, said he was so excited about the executive order because he said, and this, these are his exact words, stroke of the pen, law of the land, kind of cool, kind of cool. 
I don't know. I just feel like someday when the revolution comes, people like this are going to have to be in the dock somewhere. Okay, I mean, Not executed necessarily, but they're going to have to answer for themselves. But for example, for example, one of my favorite executive orders, and you might think I'm just cherry picking here. Well, maybe I am. It's my freaking speech. Okay, but is Franklin Roosevelt during World War II issues an executive order it's the Franklin Roosevelt Tax Simplification Executive Order, as, as I refer to it, because it says that from now on, the top income tax rate for incomes over $25,000 is 100%. So it's simple, right? You just mail it in. No complicated forms to fill out.